Um, and good evening, everyone. Can I ask the obvious question? Can you hear me? Good, because it's going to be a really difficult 35 minutes for you if you can't. Um, so um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for coming along, everyone. Um, and can I say what a joy it is not to be talking about COVID-19, lateral flow tests, second strains or DFE consultations on the awarding of grades at GCSE and A-level. Um, so, sorry, I just can't get over the fact I'm not talking about COVID-19. It's just the joy of it. So this talk is the second in a double header. And I want to say now what I'm setting out to do. Um, I want to reiterate what Hannah's just told you, <coughs> which is that it makes no difference to your understanding of this talk if you missed the last. Um, it's a bit like watching two episodes of Midsummer Murders, actually. Uh, it doesn't matter if you miss one episode of Midsummer Murders because the second um, is completely self-contained and in fact, um, exactly the same. I don't know why I keep talking about Midsummer Murders in these talks. Uh, they figured prominently last time. Um, I'm starting to think that's a bit weird. Anyway, um, in my first talk, um, the first episode of Midsummer Murders, I talked about the, the values of the Homeric world um, and how they permeated their way through the West and can be found deeply embedded in the way we do things, the way we see things, the way we think things. Um, and that was deliberately global and panoramic. Um, that was kind of like a satellite overview of the West, as it were. Uh, this is different uh, this evening. This evening is specifically about how precisely uh, the first work of Western literature, the Iliad, set the blueprint for all of Western literature that followed. Um, to that extent, it's a Western literature theory of everything. Um, so I've called it the birth of Western literature. And what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to talk a lot about the baby, the Iliad, um, and the child, the Odyssey, and then I'm going to talk about how they grew and proliferated and how they entered into and still live in our collective psyche. So what I'm going to talk about this evening is the formation of the Western literary DNA genome. Um, <clears throat> the Iliad resides in every cell of your literary consciousness, as in you personally. It is permanently at work with you personally. Every time you read a book, read a poem, watch a play, or watch a television program or a film, it is always at work. And like your actual DNA, it is everywhere within you and you are not aware of it. Um, we're not aware of how our DNA works. So this evening, I'm going to lift the veil, as it were, and we're going to have a peer into the Western double helix in a literary sense and how that double helix was formed. So I can hardly be um, accused of under ambition, but if I get a chance uh, not to talk about COVID, I'm going to talk about something interesting. So I may as well go for it. <coughs> so off we go. Um, First up, just a quick recap for those of you who weren't here and um, for those of you who were, who was Homer? Um, the answer is we don't have a clue. Um, we have virtually zero biographical information about him, but we do know from internal evidence and stylistic content of his poems that he lived from the middle to the end um, of the eighth century BC in Ionia, which is off the coast of, uh, west coast of modern Turkey. And now that's a long, long time ago. Um, that is actually before the invention of writing even in the West. Um, so Homer was a pre-literate poet living off the coast of Western Turkey. Um, and he composed the Iliad before the Odyssey. Um, and that is pretty much all we can say about Homer as an individual. Bit of background on the Trojan War, because this is obviously deeply relevant to the Iliad. Um, so all you need to know is the Greeks arrived in Troy um, in, to recover Helen of Troy, who had been taken um, by Paris, the Trojan prince. Um, another name for Troy is Ilium. 
So the term Iliad means the poem about Troy. Um, it actually means Troy story, um, if we can reduce it to that um, Pixar level. Anyway, the Trojan War lasted for 10 years and it was a stalemate. Um, however, at the end of the Trojan War, um, it, it was precipitated by these events. There was an enormous argument between Achilles, um, the best Greek warrior, and Agamemnon, the leader of the Greeks. Agamemnon, for various reasons that aren't relevant now, had taken Achilles' prize away from him. Um, Achilles went up the wall um, at this loss of face and withdrew from battle and said, all right, Agamemnon, go and win the war yourself. I'm not joining in. Um, the result of this was, was that the Trojan prince Hector, easily their best fighter, um, started winning the war and penning the Greeks back. It got so bad that they were penned to the shore and Hector managed to burn one of the Greek ships, at which point Patroclus, Achilles' best friend, said, come on, Achilles, let me, uh, if you're not going to help our friends out, at least let me push the Trojans away from the ships. Achilles said grudgingly, oh, all right then, um, but just leave it at that. Um, so Patroclus um, basically put on um, Achilles' armour, did the honours, went out and um, pushed the Trojans back, but in so doing um, was killed by Hector. Now, um, Achilles went up the wall again, um, re-entered the battle, um, went on the rampage and killed Hector. Um, in a fit of rage. He mutilated the body and kind of lost his um, marbles for a while, lost his sense of perspective. Um, he eventually returned the body to the, his uh, grieving father Priam, more of that in a moment. A couple of weeks after he killed Hector, um, Paris killed um, Achilles. Um, then at that point, um, Odysseus invented the idea of the wooden horse, and we all know about the wooden horse smuggled in a group of Greek commandos and Troy fell and was incinerated. So that's the background, that's the, back, the backdrop of the Iliad. But interestingly, and massively relevantly, it's not the plot of the Iliad. The Iliad um, is not about the Trojan War as a whole. The Iliad focuses incredibly deliberately not on the 10 years of the Trojan War, but on a very specific 50 day episode in the 10th year of it. And it's interested in the narrative arc of the rage of Achilles. So it begins with the argument of Achilles and Agamemnon, um, and it ends um, with how the rage ends. So in other words, the Iliad is about how Achilles' rage started, how it grew, how it exploded, how it ended and what the consequences were. In the same way, incidentally, in the Iliad, um, his later work, the, uh, sorry, the Odyssey, his later work, the Odyssey focuses equally deliberately, not on the 10 years of Odysseus's return from Troy, because that's done by flashback, but a very specific 50 day episode in the 10th year of that too. In other words, there's similar structuring and artistic unity between the two poems. Um, and the second is very much modeled on the first. Uh, but of course it is, because they've both got the same literary DNA. Really important point. Now, this 50-day episode follows the arc of the so-called choice of Achilles, and this is the last bit of background I'll give you. We do need to know a bit about the choice of Achilles. Um, Achilles was unique among all mortals in that he was given a very specific choice. He could either choose a long life and no glory. In other words, he'd be rich and happy with, with, you know, with, with loads of children and grandchildren running around his large palace, but no glory. Um, or he could die young and gain eternal glory. Um, these things happen to all of us, but Achilles was given the unique opportunity of choosing one or the other. Now, in, after the argument with Agamemnon, when Agamemnon took his prize away from him, this causes him to wonder whether exposing himself to daily danger, if his prize can be arbitrarily removed from him, makes him wonder whether it's all worth it. He's saying, what the hell's the point? Why should I even bother if, if it can be arbitrarily taken away from me? So he withdraws from the battle and says he'll sail home. And he says, I'm going for option one, long life and no glory. 
um, he chooses no glory because the glory um, currency has been devalued by Agamemnon's despotic behavior. He's made the whole system worthless. He's saying, why would I, why would I go out and get myself killed for an arbitrary system? Forget it. But when Hector kills his best friend Patroclus in a fit of guilty rage, he kills Hector. Now in killing Hector, and this is the point, he gains endless glory because in effect, in he who kills Hector wins the Trojan War. Hector's is the only Trojan hope. And in winning the Trojan War, you gain glory, of course. So here's the point, and this is the really important thing to bear in mind about Achilles in his psychology, as it were. When Achilles very deliberately goes to kill Hector, he knows he will win endless glory. Not that he cares anymore about glory, but that means he knows he will die young. So that means as he's just about to throw his spear at Hector, and the Iliad's very graphic and it talks about how it gets him right in the neck. Achilles knows that in effect, he's throwing a spear in his own neck. He knows he's going to die young, and that's not dying young in some indeterminate sense. That means he's going to die young in the next couple of weeks. Yeah? He knows he's dead. And this is really, really important. So he does it. He throws the spirit at him, goes for glory, but his rage doesn't diminish. Because as he comes to discover his rage is actually self-directed and killing, a, killing Hector hasn't changed anything. And the only thing that changes his mind is when he's been mutilating the body for a couple of weeks and it doesn't make him feel any better. Um, Hector, Hector's father Priam comes to see him, asks for Hector's body back and is grieving and weeping. And Achilles looks at him and he thinks, what the hell have I been doing? All I've done is just make an old man cry. And not just this old man cry, but my own father, Peleus, because I'm going to be dead in a couple of weeks. He's going to cry as well. What on earth has all this been about? In other words, here's the key point. He consigns himself to death, knowing it's all for nothing. And so the Iliad ends, not with the death of Achilles, but with Achilles about to die. Because what Achilles has been gifted with, he's got a hard won discovery, is that all of our social constructs and all the values we place on ourselves are actually and ultimately worthless. All that matters ultimately is love and integrity. Everything else is background noise, ambient noise. Um, in fact, the words spoken by Macbeth could have been written for Achilles uh, when Macbeth said, Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And this is the point. Achilles is gifted with that knowledge. <laughs> not, that, not that it feels like much of a gift. So that's the background over. So let's get over to the star of today's show, which are the opening two lines of the Iliad. Um, incidentally, whenever I read anything out in, in Greek or Latin, I, I suggest that you, you well, listen to it, obviously, but, but follow the translation as we go along. So the Iliad begins, Mein in aede tea, pelea deo achileos, ulomene, he muria kaya salgea te. Now, these lines are enormous. These lines are massive. Um, they are Western literature's big bang. In the same sense that all matter in the universe was fired out by that big bang and is still expanding, the same applies to these lines. Everything, everything comes from those lines. Everything in Western literature apart from, of course, its later fusions with other literary traditions. But everything that is inherent in Western literature comes from the Big Bang that the Iliad is. And those lines I've just read out are literally it. But I'm going to push that metaphor even further. If the Big Bang is the Iliad and its opening lines are its 
first point, then the point of singularity, to push the physics metaphor further, the point of singularity is that first word, meaning. Now, the word meaning means rage. Now, according to physicists, the universe emerged via the Big Bang from the point of singularity, the point of infinite density and gravity, before which the universe simply did not exist. And our literary point of singularity is that word meaning in red. Whatever epics pre-existed that word are now lost. From that word then came all Western literature. Now, meaning is a noun in the accusative case, meaning for us classicists that it's the object of the verb aede to sing. It's a noun in the accusative case. So that means that the Iliad starts with an accusative noun. Now, that's relevant because sentences in Greek do not usually start with accusative nouns. So any accusative at the beginning of any sentence is drawing attention to itself, let alone at the beginning of an epic poem. So it's also relevant that it's an abstract noun, rage. So Homer is signifying right at the outset of everything absolutely everything in my theory of everything that the subject of the Iliad is not the Trojan War but something abstract it's the meaning it's the rage its real subject is something psychological the rage of Achilles as I outlined earlier and he is drawing massive attention to that by shoving the word meaning unnaturally at the beginning of the sentence and therefore the epic I can't stress strongly enough how important that, that accusative placement is. Now, remember I said that the Iliad is about a 50 day episode um, in the 10th year of the Trojan War. Now, it ends with Achilles just about to die. So Achilles is still alive at the end of the Iliad and he's the man in literature who is permanently just about to die permanently knowing it and permanently knowing its futility. Indeed, he was, um, he was killed by that lucky shot. Do you remember the lucky fluke um, in his famously vulnerable heel by Paris? He absolutely um, is the real subject of the Iliad and he knows that social constructs mean nothing. Now, in other words, because he's the man who's just about to die and he does die young and he does gain endless glory. That means Achilles is the ultimate live fast, die young archetype. He is James Dean. He's Kurt Cobain. He's Princess Diana. He's the man cursed with self-directed rage who spends his literary existence trying and failing to live with it. He's cursed, he's blessed, and he's cursed with a wider viewpoint. He's the ultimate archetype. He's the first tragic hero. Here's another one. We all recognize him, don't we? Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano um, is a psychological mess. The whole series, The Sopranos, is an examination of his messed up psyche and his attempts to deal with it. Just as incidentally, the Iliad um, is a, an examination of Achilles' messed up psyche and his attempts to deal with it. Um, the Sopranos, uh, the mafia is just uh, the real plot's backdrop. But that's just sort of stage machinery, the mafia. It's just there to kind of make it more interesting to look at and engage with. Um, in the same sense that the Trojan War is background um, for Achilles' psyche. In other words, The Sopranos is a psychological examination of a leader, and in Tony's case, a sociopath. And to be fair to Achilles, he's not a sociopath. Tony is, um, but there you go. Now, Tony Soprano is recognizably um, the product of the Achilles archetype. He absolutely is. Um, so is Darth Vader. Um, Darth Vader um, is a massive 
psychological mess. Um, he's a way, way bigger psychological mess even than Tony Soprano. At least Tony Soprano manages somehow to hold down a marriage. Um, Darth Vader didn't succeed with that. Now, Darth Vader is a massive psychological mess, and that's not because he had to uh, share screen time with Jar Jar Binks. Um, the, the whole space opera um, is an examination of his messed up psyche and his attempts to deal with it. So wars in space are just the, the real plot's backdrop. Uh, the entire Star Wars saga is the narrative arc of the rage of Anakin Skywalker, how it started, how it grew, how it exploded, how it ended, and what its consequences were. Now, if I'm doing this talk right, he should be reminding you of something. So, I'll say it again. It's all about the main in. It's all about the rage. The psychology of the person with the plot as a simple backdrop. So Western literature's singularity point is an abstract noun emphatically placed, drawing attention to itself. If you remember any word from today's uh, talk, remember the word main in, the first word of European literature, an abstract noun. So it's not surprising then that uh, Jane Austen has abstract nouns as book titles. Of course she does. Uh, sensibility, persuasion, prejudice, um, sense, pride, they're all abstract nouns. Now, I'm not saying that Jane Austen thought to herself as she settled down to write about the adventures of Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy. She didn't think, oh, Homer's Iliad started with an abstract noun and an, in the accusative case emphatically placed at the beginning of a sentence and a line, and indeed a whole epic, signifying the primacy of psychological examination over plot, or more accurately, plot as a vehicle for psychological examination of characters. Of course, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that it was hardwired into Jane Austen's cultural DNA in exactly the same way that it's hardwired into yours, you individually, and me, my, mine individually. We got the same literary DNA, um, we and Jane Austen. Of course we do, because we understand Western literature. It's just inside us. Now, and that hardwiring process uh, started with the second work of Western literature, uh, Homer's follow-up to the Iliad, the Odyssey. So what I'm going to do, um, let's, I want to talk now about the hardwiring process in operation. So here we go. I, I'll, I'll read the beginning um, and again, follow the through on the translation. Andra moya nepe musa polutropon osmala pola plankthe epetroye sieron toliethon aperse. So there it is, there's the beginning. Now, first up, Homer invented sequels. The whole notion of a sequel, so common, so imprinted in our DNA, um, comes from Homer. The Odyssey is the sequel to the Iliad. Homer invented sequels. There you go. Um, and we get sequels everywhere. Um, look, here's Darth Vader again. Um, it's too good a slide just to use once. Um, and this is taken from um, The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back is a sequel to Star Wars. Um, it's, it's hardwired into George Lucas to have sequels. Mind you, it's a bit too hardwired into George Lucas to have a bit too many sequels, but you take the point. We know where the hardwiring comes from. Um, anyway, secondly, let's see if the first word, Andra, is a noun in the accusative case emphatically placed to draw attention to itself and therefore to the central theme of the epic which it begins. Oh look, and as it happens, the first word Andra is a noun in the accusative case emphatically placed at the beginning of the epic and the line to draw attention to the central theme of the epic which it begins. And what it means, it means a man, Andra, a man. Now, and as it happens, the Odyssey will be dominated by that Andra, that man. 
He will be dominated from that Greek hero, um, who the single person of Odysseus um, on his return from Troy. Um, so much so that the, the title of the poem, Odyssey, um, which means the poem about Odysseus, actually has come to mean much more. It actually means the word Odyssey has now entered the English language and it, and it kind of means an epic voyage making utmost demands on the voyager in question, thereby gifting them with hard won extra knowledge and so a deeper perspective, because that's what happens. And, and that is really important. And please remember, by the way, um, the other two bits in green, uh, Planque meaning wandering, and Troyes, which is a genitive and it means of Troy. I mean, that, that's relevant for later on. But the key point is that that word Andra, there it is, Andra, <coughs> Um, is important because the man uh, referred to is emblematic of something wider and deeper. The poem is named after the Andra, the man, and he's the vehicle for a deeper examination. Now, interestingly, the Andra, Odysseus, is not named for 50 lines or so. And that adds an element of mystery and mystique. It, it, it kind of makes him emblematic, universal, an archetype. Now, if the poem's named after him, and it's, a, and it's a vehicle to something deeper, it's no surprise then that so many plays and books and poems and films over time and in so many different cult countries and in so many different Western cultures are named after individuals in exactly the same way that the Odyssey is named after Odysseus and are vehicles for deeper psychological or social examinations, just as the Odyssey is. So, you know, they're, they're the ones that occurred to me as I was preparing the slides. So just to look at a few of them randomly now, um, I don't know, um, Othello's about sexual jealousy. Um, Hippolytus is about sexual self-righteousness. Uh, Madame Bovary uh, is about the stifling and closed um, and hypocritical sexual morality of bourgeois France. Uh, Silas Marna um, is about greed and redemption. Medea is about the tidal surge of irrational rage. Uh, Amadeus, uh, Peter Schaffer, is about genius and mediocrity. Um, I, I could go on, but I think you take the point. So, let's talk more then um, about the transmission lines of the hardwiring. So I've done hardwiring, now we've got to look at the transmission lines and how it's ended up in, in, in your psyche, because it is in your psyche. So let's have a look at the transmission lines and I'm going to scoot forward 700 years or so to the early Roman Empire now. Um, and I'm going to get onto the Aeneid by Virgil, the great Roman poet. Now Virgil wanted to write an epic um, about the greatness of Rome, about the Roman character and about the first emperor, Augustus. And he chose to do this by writing about Aeneas, a Trojan prince who fled the ruins of the sacked and burning Troy and brought a group of refugees after many trials and tribulations to Italy, where he founded the town of Lavinium. And in so doing, he set up the dynasty that would culminate in Romulus of Romulus and Remus fame. And of course, Romulus founded Rome. So Aeneas wasn't the founder of Rome, but he was the forefather of Rome and therefore the archetype for the Roman. Um, so in writing about um, Aeneas, um, Virgil can put a bit of distance between himself and Augustus. So it means when he's praising Augustus, he's not being nauseating and making you want to vomit when you read it. Um, on the other hand, he can actually, if he criticizes Aeneas, he can get away with criticizing Augustus to an extent. So he called his poem the Aeneid, the poem about Aeneas, and it starts like this, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll read it. So you, re you follow the translation and I'll read through it. So we now switch to Latin. Arma virum quecano, Troiae qui prima saboris, Italiam fato profugus, Lavinia que venit litera. Multumilia teris jactatus et alto vi superum, saeva emorem unonis obiram. Multa quoquin bello passus dum condoret urbem inferet que deus latio. So, there you go. So let's have a look at it. Now, he wants to write a Roman epic. And if you want to write an epic, you had to follow on from Homer. So to follow on from Homer was his aim, but he was even more ambitious. 
In fact, he wanted to take on Homer, improve on Homer and Romanize epic. Now that's kind of insanely ambitious. Uh, that's a bit like a, uh, it's a bit like a band in America saying, uh, we want to take the Beatles, take their music, improve on it and give it an American twist. And we don't only want to do that. Uh, we're going to shriek from the rooftops and advertise that that's what we're up to. We're going to take the Beatles on and we're going to win. Now, for normal mortals, that can't be done. Um, in fact, no one has really been stupid enough to try. I think the monkeys had a stab at it. Um, and where they had limited and localized uh, minor successes, they basically failed. Um, now, Virgil, like you and me, identically to you and me and Jane Austen, he had the Homeric Big Bang hardwired into his DNA. And he advertised what he was doing. And he said, if I'm going to do this properly, I need to acknowledge and build on the pre-existing tradition and add my own twist to it. In my case, a Romanized epic. So he did that. And I think you may well have guessed it by starting his epic with a noun in the accusative case, armor, emphatically placed to draw attention to itself and therefore to the central theme of the epic which it begins. Because armor means weapons and weapons means war. And Virgil is saying, I'm doing an Iliad, everyone. I'm doing an Iliad. And you can see other epic and Iliadic pointers in red. Um, Cano, the, the reference to the muse, um, Multicoquit Bello Passus, he also suffered much in war. So there he is shouting and screaming with his noun in the accusative case, I'm doing an Iliad. But he didn't stop there. He goes further. Um, he makes the second word of his epic, another accusative noun emphatically, emphatically and abnormally placed at the beginning of the line. And this word is, of course, virum. And virum, as it happens, is a direct translation of the Greek word andra, meaning man, that starts the odyssey. So he's, he's doing great big odyssey pointers, and he's, he adds further pointers to the odyssey in green. So there's Troy. Do you remember I asked you to remember Troyes uh, four slides ago, meaning of Troy? Well, there it is, another direct translation, andra, virum, Troyes, Troy. Um, Aeneas was exiled by fate, Fato Profugus. Um, Odysseus wandered far and wide. There's more green stuff there. Um, so Virgil is screaming his debt to Homer from the rooftops, and he's taking pre existing material and fusing it to his own to create something new and something Roman. And he may as well have, have written this I, Iliad of Iliad and Odyssey, who first came from the shores of Odyssey. Odyssey to Italy by fate came to the Lavinian shores. Odyssey by the power of the gods, unforgiving. Odyssey, Iliad. So that's how the hard wiring was and still is transmitted. Writers take pre existing material, they craft it for their own purposes, and so make additions to the tradition. Now, this is most emphatically not copying, it's the Western literary self replication process at work. It's DNA doing what DNA does. It's replicating and mutating along the way. And being DNA, there is a sense in which DNA doesn't die. It's just a set of instructions replicating itself. We're the creatures that, that die. The DNA that we carry doesn't. To this extent, DNA is immortal. So the, so the DNA process is still replicating now today. So let's scoot forward um, to, was it 1,686 years on from Virgil, and we find Milton. Now Milton um, did the same thing as him in Paradise Lost, his great Christian epic about the fall of humanity and its ultimate redemption. Um, so I'm going to read this now. And if I've got my central point across, um, you're going to see what Milton, John Milton is up to at the beginning of his epic, Paradise Lost. So here we go. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. I think you know what's coming on the next slide, don't you? Now, there it is. 
English is not a very inflected language, and so we don't have many accusatives in English. So Milton couldn't use accusative, but we do have limited inflections. That's the way the words change in their endings. And there it is, of man's. Now, you can all speak English. Look at of man's. That is a weird way to start a poem, of man's. Now, that of man's is therefore drawing its attention to itself. Really weird way to start. So Milton is clearly making a point by the placement of of man's. And he's, made, he's saying um, that humanity is his, is his theme. There's kind of a universal, universality to this, which um, chimes in um, with his cosmic theme. Because the man's is not named. And this, of course, points forward to the other man, named later on. Now, that man is clearly Jesus Christ as God. And what Milton is doing, by making the word man, he's saying, do you remember Virgil with his Virum and Homer with his Andra? Well, check me out doing just the same thing. Um, they're the giants whose shoulders I'm standing on, and here's my contribution to the tradition. So Homer did Andra, Virgil did Virum, and I'm doing of man's. Here's me adding and replicating the DNA. And finally, last slide. Um, I can't do a talk on Homer's Iliad and the birth of Western literature without finishing with James Joyce's great work, Ulysses. Now, Joyce made his great work um, a direct response to Homer's Odyssey on which it is minutely modeled. So there's the word Andra, man, the word beginning of the Odyssey, meaning Odysseus. Ulysses, incidentally, is the Romanized version of the name Odysseus. So Ulysses just means Odysseus. Now, Joyce, very interesting, really interesting. Joyce um, had a unique take on, on the Odyssey. And what his Ulysses is about, it's about one single day in Dublin, the 16th of June, 1904. And it traces that day, um, seen through the eyes of Leopold Bloom. Now, Leopold Bloom is a middle-aged seller of advertising space in newspapers, as unheroic as you can get, the reverse of Odysseus in many ways. So he sells advertising space in newspapers, and he's walking around um, Dublin, either seeing clients, stopping off for lunch at a pub at one point, takes a walk along a beach, meets some friends. Um, and each of his encounters, have parallels of Odysseus's adventures of which they're a kind of everyday inversion. So Odysseus, something grand and heroic happens with Leopold Bloom is kind of, it's kind of low key and unheroic, but in some sense a parallel. Now, Homer began um, Western literature as we've seen with a psychological examination of an individual. James Joyce continues this um, by co-inventing along with Virginia Woolf about the same time, they were both doing it, um, a technique called stream of consciousness, the stream of consciousness. Now, in the stream of consciousness, the writer actually writes out the flow of thoughts as they occur. Now, Homer took us into characters' heads. Joyce takes this to an extreme but natural conclusion by actually taking us inside their brains in real time as and when their thoughts occur. And it's extreme because with James Joyce in particular, to a much greater degree than Virginia Woolf, James Joyce actually even includes the kind of the nonsensical thought dreck that we all have. If you ever catch yourself thinking in the normal stream of consciousness of the day, we don't think in essays, we don't think in narratives. I don't think like I'm talking now and nor do any of you. We get weird, randomly occurring, irrelevant moments and funny intrusions. Um, thought dreck. Can you imagine um, if you put your thoughts of any given five minutes in a day on a page and read it, can you imagine what a challenging read it would be? Not that I'm assuming you're thinking weird things, but anyone, even if you're thinking boring things, it's a challenging read. Now, that's what you get in Ulysses. You, know, you, get, you get about 900 pages of it. 
um, usually um, from Leopold Bloom, but from other characters as well. So what I'm trying to say is this, Homer started the tradition by taking us into a character's heads. James Joyce and the 20th century and beyond that take us into their brains. And I'm gonna leave you now with the final words of the book. Um, don't worry, um, it's not much of a spoiler um, because all that happens is Leopold gets up in the morning, eats some breakfast, goes on his work, goes to bed at the end of the day, that's it. So this is, this is when he goes to bed. Um, now, when he goes to bed, his wife, Molly, is already in bed. He gets home late. Now, their marriage, we learn during the course of the book, has had various problems, but fundamentally, they still love each other. Um, and the book finishes in the last chapter with the, uh, the famous 62-page stream of consciousness of Molly Bloom. Um, it starts with the word yes, and it goes on, as I say, for 62 pages without any punctuation at all, like literally no punctuation for 62 pages. And the final full stop is the only punctuation at all in the 62 pages. And I'm going to put the final bit on screen now. And it's Molly thinking about when she first kissed Leopold uh, when they were young. Now, before I do put it up, um, I'm going to go all quiet. Um, and then I want you to read it yourselves. I'm not going to read it out. You'll see why. Um, but please do me a final favor when you read it to yourselves on screen. I want you to read it quickly in your head. Do not try to make sense of it as you go. Just go through it quickly in one go. If it doesn't make sense to you in one go, it doesn't matter. Read it quickly in one fell swoop. What you're gonna do, you're gonna find it a unique reading experience. You're gonna, we're gonna take the natural conclusion of Homer. Homer took us into a, a man's head now you're gonna get into a woman's brain. Um, so here we go, I've bigged it up. Get ready for a unique reading experience and the final culmination of the Western DNA. Here it comes, it's Molly Bloom thinking about when she first kissed Leopold when they were young. So there you have it, everyone. Um, Homer and Western literature and the triumph of the human heart and head. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, no right, problem. on to questions. I've already had a couple more come in, but if people think of them, do pop them in the chat and we will get through um, as many as we can in the in the time we've got left so um first question oh, this is a good one what are mr stubbing's thoughts on the discussions surrounding the homeric question oh yeah no no the homeric question uh, is an interesting one. the homeric question um is this is is given that we don't know anything about homer at all how can we even know a that homer existed and b if he did exist he even actually composed the Iliad and the Odyssey. And even if he did compose one of them, how do we know he composed the other? How do we know? In the Victorian period, um, the, the view was very, very much um, before there was detailed literary analysis of the structure of the two epics that essentially they, that Homer was simply an amalgam. Someone kind of turned up and shoved pre-existing material together. In a bit way, in the same way that I don't know that, a, that a, an undergraduate, an unscrupulous undergraduate might plagiarize, pull stuff out of the internet and shove it all together and call it an essay. Um, it became very, very clear, however, um, to people who looked more closely um, that, first of all, there's a complete unity of structure between the two epics in that they both, as I said earlier on, follow a 50 day period in the 10th year of their respective 10 year period and they fan out from there. So clearly, um, 
it's it's not just shoved together by by an unscrupulous undergraduate pulling stuff off the internet. It just can't be that that you know that fluke wouldn't happen twice. So it's de it's either the same man um, because it would have been a man back in the day. That's how it worked. Doing the same doing the same thing twice, or a second man about a generation later modeling self himself on the work of the first man. Um, to, I don't know which one it is. Um, on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, I think it was one person. And on um, Thursdays, um, Tuesdays and Saturdays, I think it's two people. I just don't know. But there is an extent to which it actually doesn't matter because Homer, um, Homer is, is kind of turned into Shakespeare. Shakespeare has become his plays and poems. Doesn't matter. Uh, he is his plays and poems, and that's who Homer is. Um, so I don't know if I've answered it properly, but basically there was there was clearly um, a guiding literary monolithic genius at work, um, either on two pieces of work or two turned up one after the other. Thank you. Um, I feel like your essay, your, your title of your lecture might answer this one, but someone has asked if you would say that the Iliad or the Odyssey has influence. And they, uh, this person has said modern culture, but I would put it into literature as well, since that's specifically what we're talking about. So would you say the Iliad was more of an influence? I, I, I would, yes, on the grounds that it precedes the Odyssey and that the Odyssey is by definition modelled upon it. So whether Homer composed um, the, the, the Odyssey or not, um, the other person worked based on the Iliad. So it is very much a sequel. Um, it's, it's very clear that the Odyssey takes its cue from the Iliad um, and that all the, all the constructs within it um, emanate primarily from that poem. Um, the, it, the Iliad, I'll be straight, the Iliad is a greater poem. It is, it just is. I prefer the Odyssey, I kind of love it. Okay. The opening word of Ulysses is not a noun, it's an adverb, stately. This is an unusual way to start a sentence, let alone a novel. Do you believe this is an attempt to parallel Homer? It is, it's, it's interesting. Um, if, 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 yeah, if people want to have a look at the beginning of, uh, of Ulysses, it's interesting. It goes stately, plump, buck, mulligan. Um, and he's, he's carrying, um, um, as I recall, a, he's wet shaving. Um, and he and then he refers to um, the snot green sea, which he can see out of the window. Now, the snot green sea is typical James Joyce at work. Um, that is a direct um, naughtiness on Homer's wine dark sea. So, yes, it is, it is. It does start weirdly with an adverb. But Joyce is saying, I'm not playing that funny noun game. I'm going to start with, a, with an adverb. And you see how Homer um, calls it wonderfully poetically the wine dark sea. Well, I'm going to call it the snot green sea because I'm in the I'm in the game of kind of. It's not undermining her, Homer. It's giving him a series of profound reverse compliments. Snot green sea. There's your answer. Gosh, right. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, if it's the case that genetics and environment influence behaviour. Is the effect of the Iliad on Western literature diminishing over time? Okay, would that mean if writing today didn't have Homeric DNA, it would not be literature? Gosh, that's good questions. Come in. That's, that's, that's a hell of a question. That's a really good question. <laughs> good luck. Um, yeah, I suppose, um, I suppose to carry on the DNA metaphor, um, there is an extent to which DNA, by combining with uh, other DNA strands, does, does, does slowly... Um, um, dilute and mutate itself over time. And please forgive me any scientists who are listening if, if, I'm, if that's a scientifically illiterate remark. But God knows um, we're living um, at the moment. I mean, we've all become experts in genetic mutation with this wretched virus that's out there at the moment and how the, these variants do come along. And over time, yeah, the mutations do take place. And over, and over extreme time, yes, um, it will mutate itself into something different. So it's a bit like evolution, I suppose. Um, I, I, I gather um, that whale, every whale 
um, that exists um, is, 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 is an evolutionary product of a small mouse-like creature that first entered the sea. Um, so whales don't look like mouse-like creatures, um, but they, they still carry deep within them the archetypal DNA. And I think that will always be the case in Western literature, yes. Okay. Um, given that the start of Western literature has a distinct few items, and there had to be knowledge of preceding liter literary moments, where does that leave us now in the story of Western literature, where so many pieces of work are produced every year? Can you still see Homer as the father of Western literature, or is the body of literature so huge now that it's lost all reason? Um, another, another really good question. What's, what's really interesting about Homer is, of course, Homer didn't see himself as, as, as the progenitor of Western literature, because all Homer saw himself as was, 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 was another professional bard who was working on pre-existing material. And the only, the only, it's only by a chronological quirk um, that, that that stuff has gone. It looks as if he's dwarfed his predecessors by the ambition and scope of what he's done and kind of blown it out of existence. Um, I take the thrust of that question and I acknowledge it because it's, it's hyper proliferating at such a massive rate. And of course, now we've got um, the online universe. I completely, uh, I completely agree. However, if my metaphor of a Big Bang stands, um, there has to be um, the, the point of singularity, the, the point from which everything expands. And yes, it will hyper-proliferate, and yes, that, that um, archetypal DNA might even become junk DNA one day. That might happen. Um, but at the moment, I would contend that it's still there and operating, not least in our, in our education system. Um, I don't know, we teach King Lear at A-level. Um, King Lear um, is, is, a, is, a, is a tragic hero um, who's modelled on, on, on the Greek tragic heroes who take ultimately um, their, their archetype is, is, is Achilles himself. So, and this is why, this is why I brought in the Sopranos and, and uh, Star Wars. Um, now, of course, George Lucas, you know, you know, when I think about the Iliad, I presume, um, but it doesn't mean that he, he's, he's not carrying it around inside him. Okay, um, this is a good question. Why Western literature, in particular, for this talk? Doesn't this apply to Eastern as well? And how? Would, what's the distinction for you? No, the, 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 well, that, that, again, that's a really good question. Um, the, for the fact is, um, there was no Western literature that exists before Homer. Um, there was um, Semitic literature before Homer. Um, there were there were some of the Psalms. Um, were composed before the Iliad, absolutely. But this is not about them. Um, that's a completely different literary tradition. Um, Eastern literature, of course, you know, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh is much more ancient than Homer. Um, but but um, um, there, were, there are different literary lines um, across the planet, and I'm simply talking about this one um, where in, in the part of the planet that we inhabit. Um, but absolutely, they're, they're, you know, I, I've got zero expertise um, on, on Eastern literature and where that comes from. I know a bit about the Psalms, but um, one thing I would say is, is quite interesting is this. Um, if you take, um, you, if you read, say, Matthew's Gospel. Now, Matthew, uh, Matthew was a Jew writing for a Jewish audience. Now, in, in other words, um, he inherited a different literary tradition. If you read, um, say, Matthew's Gospel, um, one thing that you don't get very often in, in the Gospels, um, and I'm talking about Matthew in particular here, you don't get many um, descriptions of what's going on in characters' heads, what their motives might be. You get descriptions of what they do and the stuff that they say to each other, but you get very little um, of, of their inner lives. So, um, when Peter talks about you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and that's a moment of, of, of inspiration. Matthew doesn't say Peter had a moment of divine inspiration because that's kind of a Western thing to write. He, in other words, if you read it, you can see it, come, it stems from a different, literary, a different literary line, not an inferior one, obviously, just a different one. OK, I think I'm just going to take two more questions just looking at the time, so apologies if we... Don't get to yours. Um, 
what are your opinions about modern interpretations of the epics things like the song of achilles the secret history literature like that no i love them um you know i read them all um uh, margaret atwood um is, is especially good um you should read margaret atwood's stuff um on on all the stuff relating to the penelope ad um loads and loads there no i love it um no i can't get enough of it yeah love it all Okay, did Virgil succeed in outdoing Homer? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the eternal question. <laughs> um, I think no, um, um, but I only think no to the extent um, that, let's have a look. He only just missed. I mean, he, he really aimed high um, and, and he set out what he wanted to do. I mean, he... His, his primary aim was to take um, epic, Greek epic, and Romanize it, and to use it to glorify the Augustan regime. And in that, he, he absolutely hit it out of the park. Whether he's better than Homer or outdid him is, is a matter of um, personal taste. Um, I don't think so, but that's my personal taste. But then again, I prefer brown sauce to ketchup. And I think it comes down to that level. Wonderful. Right. Looking at the time, I think we'll leave it there. So just thank you again so much, Mr. Stubbings. And thank you all so much for coming along this evening. It really is greatly appreciated. Um, it's lovely to be able to keep bringing people together in whatever way we can in these really strange times. And we hope you're all keeping safe and well. Um, just to plug, we will be continuing to run these Ed Talks. Um, we will send you full details very soon, especially to everyone who signed up this evening. The next one will be on the 24th of February. Um, it'll be the same time as 6 p.m. And it will be with Mr. Godwin, who's our assistant head. And it will be an interesting and a more geographical subject this time. So moving slightly away from literature. Um, so we'll send you all the details and we hope you can tune in for that one as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, do do come along to David Godwin's um, geography talk. Um, the, the only reason um, that it's, it's so literary is that I'm... I'm a literary person and um, Sheila O'Connell's really good. Um, so we started off, we started off with those. Um, these Ed Talks are not kind of literary talks. Uh, they happen to have been so far. And so I've, I'm very much looking forward to, to the 24th of February, 6 p.m. Come along to hear David Godwin um, talking about um, something geographical, which to be fair is pretty different from what you've heard from me this evening. So thanks for coming along everyone. Um, I see there were 115 at one point, um, so that was um, gratifying. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure, and um, you'll be hearing from me banging on about COVID a lot from here on in. Thanks a lot, and bye-bye.